morning, everyone. My name is Michael Granger, and I'll be talking about LDAP today. Um, I admit that I gave it a slightly inflammatory subtitle, but uh, I have honest intentions. So, to give you a brief overview, um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the NoSQL idea and why I think LDAP fits it. And I'll give uh, another introduction to LDAP for those who maybe haven't used it in Hangar before. <laughs> and then I'll show a bit of each of the four ways to access LDAP from Ruby and show off one we're using called Treacle, uh, how we're using it at my day job. So why LDAP? Well, maybe I need to back up a little bit. Maybe I should first ask why no SQL? Well, what is NoSQL apart from not using MySQL or PostgreSQL or whatever? The definition of the term MySQL or NoSQL is still the subject of some debate, but I'm using the, the definition from NoSQLDatabase.org, which has a fairly comprehensive list of the NoSQL technologies by category. And there are apparently some of the features, some features are in a, pretty much in debate right now, but. Uh, these seem to be the four that everyone can mostly agree on. I'm not really sure what the last one has to do with NoSQL, but it's a good thing, so it's uh, one thing they list. Some of the other features they list are, uh, they claim a little bit more controversial, but I find them pretty interesting too. So I think those features are pretty generic, and the, the NoSQL technologies that they list on their site cover a wide gamut of uses and problem domains, but I think that LDAP fits what they call a wide column store. Uh, it's useful for storing structured data that doesn't conform to tables and relational algebra easily. And I think LDAP fits that because the other ones that they list, like uh, HBase, Cassandra, Hypertable, all have this concept of column families, and they store or some of them store data in a hierarchy, which all that does as well. So, I'll give a brief introduction to LDAP, and I'll try to keep it brief for those of you who may have used it. Um, first, a bit of history. LDAP originated in the telecommunications industry, which is probably why it's still considered by a lot of people as a glorified phone directory or address book. It's, uh, it was started out in 1998, the uh, International Telecommunication Union and the Embassy of the United Nations approved a networking standard called X500. It was uh, it included a protocol called DAP for Directory Access Protocol for accessing directory services, which sat on top of the OSI protocol stack. Uh, LDAP was invented as an alternative to that uh, that used TCP/IP instead of OSI. Apparently. OSI was incredibly difficult to implement. It wasn't around then, but so I've heard. Uh, LDAP is a pretty simple protocol. It has 11 operations. The operations are generally independent of one another. They're uh, processed as atomic actions, and each leaves the directory in a consistent state. Uh, most operations don't need to wait for a response, so it plays really nicely if you want to use it asynchronously, and responses can arrive in any order, so when you're writing a client, you have to be aware of that. The directory is structured as a set of entities that are organized into a hierarchy. Uh, superior subordinate relationships between entries are used to express a relationship between them. In the RFC, an entry is described as information about an object which is identifiable or can be named. It's composed of a set of attributes about the subject and is identified by a distinguished name or a DN. The distinguished name is made up of one or more relative distinguished names or RDNs that describes the path from the entry back up to the root of the hierarchy. Each RDN is unique amongst its siblings as it must be distinguishable from them. This means that an entry's parent can be found by removing the first RDN of its DNA. So I said before that entries are made up of one or more attributes. And this is a turn down dump of my user record in LDAP at my day job that I'll use as an example. So an attribute is an attribute description which consists of a type and optional options. 
and what are more associated values. They're basically key value pairs with a few additions. The keys aren't freeform values but are defined in the directory schema. They're referred to as the attribute description and <coughs> determines the type of values it can hold, what validations apply to it, and how it can be searched for and not dissimilar to a column in an SQL table. Values are one or more binary chunks of data that conform to the type dictated by the description. There aren't any here for obvious reasons, but you can, for example, store an employee photo, a voicemail greeting, or other binary data in the same entry. Which attributes can be contained by an entry is dictated by its object classes. An entry's object classes are itself, are themselves attributes, and the only mandatory one for every, ent for every entry. It's required by the top object class, which is the abstract base object class of all entries. Object classes like attribute types are defined in the directory schema. Similar to Bigtable or Cassandra's column families, the entry's object classes govern the attributes that are required and allowed to be contained in an entry, as well as where it can live and a few other things. The RFC describes it as an identified family of objects or conceivable objects that share certain characteristics. There are three kinds of them. They are abstract, which are pretty much the same thing as abstract classes in OOO. They can be added only through inheritance. Structural object classes are somewhat the same as concrete classes. They can, there can be only one per entry. And auxiliary object classes are mix-ins of LDAP can be added to any entry. Here's my user record from before, but sorted into what the object class the attributes belong to. An attribute can and often does belong to more than one object class. There are a bunch of other cool things that you can do with LDAP that I won't cover here today, like introspection into the directory schema, referral attribute type options, and other stuff stuff like that, but uh, if you want to geek out about LDAP afterwards, let me know. Still learning, but uh, I've been using it for about four years, and I still find it pretty exciting. Now, how can you access LDAP from Ruby? There are a few ways to do it, and here are four. I'll cover two low-level libraries, and then two high-level libraries that use one or both of the low-level ones to provide a more convenient abstraction. First up is Ruby LDAP. It's a C extension. It's been around since about 2000. And it's based on the API described in RFC 1823, which basically describes how, if you're writing an application that uses LDAP, how you might, the things you might want to do and how to do them in a consistent way. It's the most complete LDAP library I know of, but it's missing support for some of the lesser used operations. But in daily use, you'll probably never run across that. So here's what accessing my, rec my user record looks like. It connects using TLS, sets a few search parameters, and then executes the search and prints out the results. The base that it's setting there is the DN of the highest part of the hierarchy you want to search from. And the scope says how far down the hierarchy to go. In this case, because it says LDAP scope subtree, we're going to search the whole subtree. And then that filter is how you form a query in LDAP, which looks a lot like Lisp has uh, prefix notation and everything's in parentheses. Another alternative is Net LDAP, and it's been around since 2003, and it's excellent for most purposes, but it's missing a few things that Ruby LDAP provides, but again, in normal, everyday use, you probably won't even notice it. <clears throat> Another advantage that it has is it's more portable than uh, Ruby LDAP because it's pure Ruby instead of being a C extension. But here's what using it looks like. It's basically the same thing, but using a hash for searching instead of positional parameters, which is nicer, I think. And it provides an abstraction for building filters out of just uh, key value pairs like that, so you don't have to form the Lispish looking filters yourself. So that's the two low-level libraries, and now onto the high-level abstractions. Uh, 
Uh, first one is active LDAP. And active LDAP's authors describe it as an object-oriented interface to LDAP. And it uses some of the active record idioms to present a similar interface to your LDAP data. Especially good when your domain classes are mixed between an RDMF, RDBMS, and LDAP, uh, but it is a bit more complex, a bit more difficult to use for the more complex LDAP directories. <coughs> if you're already using Active Record and your directory is fairly, fairly small and contiguous, Active LDAP is easy to get started with. I used it for about three years along with Active Record at my day job, but ran into trouble when I tried to access data that was scattered across the directory or sibling entries with different object classes. That was two years ago though, so I'd still recommend giving it a try if you like Active Record. Here's what it looks like doing the same task as before, but it defines an account class to pull the records out instead of using a raw search. It uses that LDAP mapping attribute, uh, or declarative, I guess, to set up the prefix that all the classes will start their search at. And the DN attribute is the attribute that it will use when you do a find by ID. It, of course, provides accessors for attributes, just like Active Record. You can see there, it's fetching the CN of the entry, just like before. Treequal is another high-level LDAP abstraction written by myself and a few of my coworkers. We wanted to make basic LDAP interaction easy without compromising its natural flexibility. It's based on similar ideas from SQL, which we use to replace Active Record in our web applications. Since Active LDAP depends on Active Record and we're running into limitations with it anyway, we decided to implement something similar for LDAP. So this is using Treequal to do the same task as the previous examples, fetching my user record, using only the basic interface. So it connects to an LDAP server by URL or hash arguments, but it also knows how to read the system LDAP config and use that if you want to do that. So the way Treequal works is it maps method calls to RDNs. So this OU method is returning what we call a branch set that is based at OU people. A branch set is a concept borrowed from SQL's data sets. It's a search and suspension that you can execute or further modify at will. So we add a filter to the branch set that looks for entries with UID set to end ranger, and then fetch and extract a CN attribute from each result. And Treacle also comes with an optional ORM-like layer that's based on the idea of using mixins to enhance entry objects based on their object class. And it's loosely based on SQL model. So this is the same task, but with a mixin defined for entries that have the like account and person object classes and that live under the OU people entry. Now, any entry that you fetch from LDAP that matches its criteria by the configured model class will be extended with this mixin. So you don't even have to know that the Acme account mixin is around. It just will be automatically added to anything that you fetch from LDAP that has the necessary criteria. The mixin also sets up a search method that uh, is based on its object classes and base. And then you can append further filters on it just as you would with the raw branch set like SQL does with SQL model. Then executes the search but extends each result with the mixin before it's returned or yielded, which adds any methods or functionality specific to matching entries. I don't have any additional methods in that module, but you can imagine that you might want to add, like if you have a JPEG photo, you might want to return a uh, image magic object or something and do things with it, you could, you could add that to based on the attributes that the object classes of that mixing uh, had. So the base ORM class, Treacle model, supplies the generic attribute accessors and, and the like. So now I'll go over a little bit of how we use LDAP at my day job. 
I work for Leica, which is a stop motion and computer animation company in Portland, Oregon. And we make feature films like Coraline. <laughs> and we also make TV ads for a bunch of different people. So, my day job is uniquely challenging, I think, or at least it's unique in my experience. Because animators are a bit like programmers. They go wherever there's cool stuff to work on. It's not uncommon for us to bring on 400 or more people during the ramp up for a feature film and then have them leave for after the film is over for another couple of years and then come back if there's something new we're working on that they're interested in. They have some specialty that we need. Also, uh, animation and photography technology is continually progressing. They're always coming out with new, neat hardware, HD video, 3D cameras, all kinds of new stuff that's coming out. So we need to stay competitive and give our artists systems that will run the latest and greatest animation tools. So we're constantly upgrading and moving people's machines around. We also replace network storage and the render farm about every five years or so, which requires lots of reconfiguration, updating of both workstations and servers. Despite those challenges, our IT department is pretty small. We have eight IT people, including the director, with four users to support people and four infrastructure people. We're responsible for about 2,500 individual hosts in four physical locations running four different OSs with anywhere from 200 to 600 users at any given time, all of whom fluctuate rapidly over the years. So we'd pretty much be dead without automation of some sort. And key to that is a unified place to store all the organic data you need to track about people and the computer systems that they use. So here's a brief idea of how our LDAP is set up. We're running two FreeBSD servers with OpenLDAP per physical location, with one primary and one per failover. We have a single master that's in downtown Portland and all the other servers are replicating from it. We have Ruby installed on nearly every machine and a suite of tools written in Ruby that's installable by a private gem server. It's just a screenshot from the, the list of gems that we have currently. Of course, the first place to start when you're using LDAP is the company directory. Uh, provides a unified logon and workstations, servers, and web applications. It gives you POSIX groups, net groups for treating groups of hosts as a single unit, and all the other NIS-ish stuff. For one second. It also drives our web-based company directory which is currently a mod Perl Mason component, but it's slated for replacement with a newer Ruby-based application real soon now. We use a command line tool written in Ruby to manage all user data. This is the bit we use to find an unused phone extension for new users. The relevant LDAP bits are here. This is using Treacle again. Uh, it looks for entries that are either user accounts or resource, resource accounts like conference rooms. That's what that first filter clause is doing. And then it eliminates ones that don't have a phone. So the second filter clause says that the phone extension attribute must be present. And then eliminates ones that aren't in the requested location. So we have the L attribute on each of the phone that has the physical location of the phone, which is currently just the four physical locations that we're in. And then it selects just the phone extension attribute from uh, all of the results. And then turns them all into an array, flattens and compacts them. And each location has one or more extension ranges, uh, which are defined as Ruby ranges. And they're currently hard-coded, but we'll eventually fetch those from the lab too. So that's what the top bit is doing, is it's looking up that range object for whatever physical location you're in. And then it collects over the ranges down below, 
and turns all of the extensions that are in that range into four digit extension numbers. And then uses array math to find the available ones by subtracting the used ones that it found in LDAP from the valid ones that it extracted from the range. So speaking of phones, we run an asterisk voice over IP system with one box per physical location, all trunked together with eeks. And all the phones live as physical asset records in LDAP, and assigning a phone to a person automatically associates their phone number with that phone. The dial plan and several other of asterisk's config files are generated from LDAP. And we started this before I had heard of adhesion, but adhesion is definitely on our list of things to check out in the future. But in the meantime, this is a greatly stripped down version of the bit that generates the extensions config. The, the LDAP bits are here, fetches an array of all the phones that are in the locations being requested to have an owner. And the reason it checks for an owner is when someone leaves, we just remove the owner association from the phone record, which automatically disables their extension. And that way, if they come back, we just reassociate them with any other phone. And if their extension hasn't already been reclaimed, it will, they'll have the same exact extension, voicemail, and everything as if they've never left. So this, then it builds a hash of phone entries by their owner's extension, dropping anyone that doesn't have an extension. And the phone owner attribute here is a DN. And Trequel is actually smart about DNs. It'll actually do a second lookup if it notices that you're fetching something that's a DN and give you another Trequel object back. And this obviously is doing one LDAP query per phone record, which could probably be optimized a bit better, but it works as is. Then the extensions are appended to the config that's returned and written out to the asterisk config directory and then we tell asterisk to reload everything. And this happens uh, currently by a cron, but we're working on a way to using uh, synchronized replication in LDAP to react to people making uh, related changes in LDAP to automatically rebuild asterisk on demand. Another thing we store in LDAP is all the computer information. We store all of our hosts in LDAP, which in turn is used to generate DNS and DHCP. And it does that on a, a location basis. So we're running an individual DNS and DHCP server for every physical location. And uh, the DHCP information includes netboot information. So we can actually uh, provision and set up a machine just by dropping down to the network, changing some bits in LDAP and netbooting it and it'll auto image to whatever we whatever role we tell it it should be. We have a command line tool for doing this as well. Uh, we're also midway through converting our physical asset inventory system from one backed by a Postgres database into one backed by LDAP. <coughs> And this will let us store purchasing information, physical location, and what software is being run as additional attributes or child entries right alongside the host information. It uses, it'll use uh, DHCP events again published over AMQP to also set a host last known attribute location, or last known location attribute, which will make our physical inventories go much quicker. So every time someone plugs a machine into a network, it'll modify that record in LDAP that will say what location at last was plugged in. That way if you ever need to go find the host, you can go and uh, have a pretty good idea of where it is. So this is the code that generates the DHCP entries. Really the only complicated bit is the function that turns a DN into an FQDN. So the DN, as you'll remember, is the distinguished name of the entry for the host. and <coughs> Minus the OU part of it, it's actually, uh, you can directly transform that into the, the TCP IP FQDN. So it just catenates the DC attributes of the CN1 and throws away the OU, and that's the, that's the host name. So everything else is pretty much string catenation of various attributes. Uh, ISC's DHCPD does support LDAP through its own schema as well, but because of the way they structure it, it means that you really can't use the DHCP data for anything else. Like you can't attach DHCP information to 
already existing host directories. So we gave up on that and implemented our own. So for DNS, we use uh, Dan Bernstein's Dan Bernstein's Tiny DNS, and it's uh, compiled from a very, fairly simple text file. Auto generating it is also pretty simple. This selects the hosts that have an assigned IP and generates an entry for each one. Here we filter on any host that uh, must have an IP host number, which is what the the schema calls the IP address. And then uh, that make tiny DNS entry function basically just rips out all of the attributes necessary to build the, the DNS uh, and appends them to the string and returns them. Uh, that config is then written out and it compiles it to a CDB, the new DNS data, flushes, flushes the DNS cache statement and it's off and running again. So another thing we use LDAP for is for monitoring. Uh, computer systems fail all the time, and with this many hosts and such huge dollar figures associated with artist downtime, a monitoring system is pretty critical. To do the actual monitoring, we use MON, which is a very simple but battle-tested monitoring system written in Perl with a Ruby and Rake-based configuration generation system that pulls net groups out of LDAP, splits off monitoring zones by network subnet, and then writes out the config files with automatically derived dependencies to avoid being crushed by alerts when the core router blips. So this is the code that makes an array of hosts to monitor given a net group. And using net groups makes it easy to add hosts to the monitoring system. So as you can see there, starting at the OU, OU is organizational unit, it's basically just a uh, generic group class. Uh, have an OU called net groups where all the net groups are stored, and then it just filters them by the CN or the common name of the net group. And then uh, net groups are stored in NIS net group triples, which is a weird looking string that is a, a leftover artifact of NIS. And it's basically a host, user, and domain uh, in a common separated string inside of parens. And we pretty much only ever use the host part of it, so it just extracts that stuff and it collects and then uh, recurses on itself for member NIS, member NIS net group, which is how you can embed one net group inside of another. So another thing we're working on for monitoring is a system that will let us store services to be monitored as there's a, an object class called IP service, which is, as far as we can tell, intended for something like this. And so we can store IP service entries under the actual host record. And then finding out what should be monitored will be just fetching every IP service, uh, every host that has an IP service from LDAP, and then auto-generating it from that. So this is a dump from LDAP using a shell that is included with TreeCold that lets you navigate an LDAP directory like a, a command line, basically. So here I'm just catting the CN equals CF is uh, one of the hosts that we have. It's our CF engine uh, daemon in, uh, server. And then I just cat the CF server D uh, IP service underneath that, and it says what it is uh, what protocol and what port it's listening on. So, and just basically monitor that port and that IP, and that's it. So, to wrap up, uh, if you find yourself needing a non-relational database, uh, I hope you'll consider giving LDAP a try, especially if you're already using it for other things. And it can be a little weird with its OIDs and strange syntax, but it's a good, solid, flexible technology that I think has gotten overlooked as being just for address books. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, do you use OpenLDAP or something else? Yes, OpenLDAP. What about the previous implementation so much
Yeah, that's the newer one. Uh, okay, that's right. the one that actually works really well. Right, I took care of sync. Yeah. How was your experience with that? So we monitor that by checking. There's a. Uh, sorry, I'll repeat the question. He was asking uh, earlier implementations of OpenLDAP, especially used an older um, version of replication that basically catted the LDIF from the directory out and then piped that to another process which was reading it on another host. And they've since replaced that with something called sync REPL, which is an invented uh, way using an LDAP control where the master server will actually notify <coughs> any child servers. Uh, and you can actually replicate just a part of the directory or the whole directory. And it'll notify it with an event anything, anytime anything changes. Uh, and he was asking how, how we monitor that and how we keep it, make sure that it's consistent. Um, there's actually an attribute in the extended attributes of the base OU that uh, is a CSN. Uh, it's the serial number for the last transaction. So we just fetch that from the master server and then go look at all the slaves and make sure their CSNs are all the same. And if one of them drifts, we wait for five seconds and check it again. If, it, if it's drifted, then we alert. Do, uh, do object classes, do they kind of work like mixers? Are they traits? Yes. Uh, so object classes are, they carry a set of attributes with them. So an entry can be thought of as a, a, a set that's composed of all of the entries of all of its object classes. So uh, object classes have must and may attributes. The must ones are ones which, if you include an attribute in the entry, all of the, all the attributes in its must, must, be, must have at least one value. And then the may ones are just optional ones that you can use by virtue of including that object class. So the way treacle works is it actually creates a mixing for an object class. So it's, it's making Ruby treat uh, object classes pretty much the same way LDAP does. Anybody else? I kind of, uh, I guess I was talking much slower in my hotel room, so have a bunch of time. Yeah. What, I'm sorry, say that again. What are the largest volumes of data you store in LDAP? Or the Uh, Like as far as Mil data millions, size? Millions of records, how much, how much data size, disk storage, that kind of stuff. You wanna, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure. Let me check real quick. I have one running on my local machine. So. I assume that you're asking because one of the NoSQL virtues is uh, that you can store incredibly large amounts of data. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I have not investigated its suitability for those you know, massively. I do know that LDAP is used to store incredibly large directories, much larger than ours. But as to specific numbers, I don't know. Um, I would guess ours is maybe three gig or so, uh, probably not, nothing to write home about, but I, I guess uh, my point is that if you're running LDAP in a lot of places already are, and you want to use something that uh, stores structured data and you don't, you, you don't necessarily need the huge massive scalability that LDAP makes a pretty good fit. Yeah. What uh, database are you using to store your LDAP in? Is it for, uh, BDB? <coughs> It's, it's a variant of BDB called HDB, the hierarchical database. Uh, they actually just switched to that. Uh, OpenLDAP had a bunch of problems with corruption when it was using straight BDB, but we've had no problems at all since we switched to HDB. Are there alternatives to that that people use? Or basically much um, there, so OpenLDAP does, what he's asking is are there alternatives to uh, storing your data in uh, Berkeley DB? Um, there are a bunch of different backends. One of them is an SQL backend, there's a shell backend. There's a bunch of different things that you can use to map your attributes, uh, map your LDAP data into something else. And we've not used any of those. Uh, we experimented with the SQL one, which was pretty much disastrous, so we abandoned that. 
Anything else? Yeah. Do you um, have migrations? Do you, do you change your mind about what's going to be in a schema and uh, migrate things across? Do you have a strategy for that? We do. Uh, what he was asking is, do we have migrations if we decide something needs to change in a schema? Um, we don't have migrations in the same sense as like Active Record does. Um, there's not really any way to, uh, if you change the schema, up until recently anyway, if you change the schema, it required a server restart. So we had to basically just keep all of the schemas in version control and uh, sync all of the servers to the same revision uh, that we have a tag and then uh, restart all the servers. Uh, you have to restart the, the master first and then while the slaves are down and then restart the slaves so they sync with the same schema. Um, uh, we just actually switched to OpenL.24 which has a dynamic config too. It stores its configuration in LDAP itself. And supposedly that allows you to change schemas on the fly, but we, we haven't tried that yet. So. What about the data? Change the data across? Do you have a, do you just run a script or? Uh, so far, we haven't had any conflicting uh, changes to the schema. Like we haven't changed the column name or anything. Um, you could, well, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure how you, how you would manage that. Because if you change the attribute name, the, one of the things about LDAP that's really interesting is a lot of the schemas are really old and fairly stable. Um, we have added our own, but so far we've only done additions. So uh, if you change the name of an attribute or removed one, that would be, I'm not exactly sure how you would do that. Yeah. Um, so you're scaling rates by just adding slides, how do you scale rise? Uh, OpenLDAP does support multi-master but they recommend still against using it. So uh, LDAP is considered a read many, write seldom. So uh, basically just, I don't think there is, well, so you can uh, federate LDAP directories together. You can separate the writes of different parts of the hierarchy onto different servers and then have them all federated together by a referral. So if you go to one part of the directory and try to write to a slave, for example, it will tell you where the master, where you, go to, uh, where you need to go to write. So you just split those off into like different branches of your hierarchy. A shard and partition. Right. Uh, a lot of universities, for example, use that. They have different departments. The write master is uh, per department, so each department manages their own, uh, their own little writable section of the tree but then it's all federated into one big data store at the top. Anything else? Okay.